as you just heard, we are recording this session. So welcome again. My name is Dr. Gia Kelly, and I am the director of uh, transformation teams with Intac. Um, I am also a change consultant and um, uh, IPV uh, expert as it relates to um, just the intersection of intimate partner violence and children. Um, and so uh, it has really been on my heart to raise awareness in the area of mental health um, about intimate partner violence. Um, this is um, Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And so it was very befitting to, um, to lift up this, um, this issue and to bring awareness to it, but not just to talk about the statistics and how it harms families. We all are aware of that but really to bring voice and narrative to this by bringing in survivors, by bringing in those who have lived this, who have overcome this. Um, and so this um, whole series for this month is really about both trauma and resilience. And so we don't want to leave that out. So as I stated last week, we started with um, our first session, our introduction to this topic. And we had a powerful uh, survivor story um, with La LaVon Grant Morris. And it was just phenomenal. Many of you, I see your faces. You were here last week. So thank you all for joining us again. So we're gonna keep our conversation going as we look at the, intimate, the impact of intimate partner violence on children. And so, um, I'll start off with just a little bit of um, housekeeping uh, at, before we move um, into our presentation. And so what we want you all to know is as part of our session, um, we have to provide you with this disclaimer. This presentation was prepared by Intact under a cooperative agreement with SAMHSA. While this event is supported by SAMHSA, the contents are those of the authors and do not necessarily represent the official views of SAMHSA, HHS, or the US government. Also, while we hope that there will be no security issues while we are in community together, if anything like that should happen, we want you to know that this session will immediately end and you will be notified by email um, how to rejoin using a new link. All right. So no worries. Nothing will happen. But just in case, uh, we do have a plan for that. So our agenda um, is as follows. We um, have already been welcomed into our community. Um, I'm going to go into a bit of a little bit of an overview about Intact, just so you know who we are, because we may have some folks who are just joining uh, for the first time uh, this week. And then we will talk, um, we will introduce our uh, presenter today, um, Casey Keene, as she talks about uh, childhood trauma and resilience um, and her story and the story of her siblings as it relates um, to this issue. Um, and then we'll leave some time at the end for questions and answers from you all. So I'm going to ask that you would um, please, if you have questions that come up, we want to ask that you would just note those and jot those down because we don't want to interrupt as um, the presentation is happening, but we will leave some time to be able to address at least a few of your questions. The other thing that I'm going to ask um, is that you all will come on camera if you can. Uh, we wanna honor those who are sharing their lived experience. We know that everybody can't, but I do wanna just ask you if you would, just out of respect and out of honor for those who are sharing stories. If you can come off and be present with us, we would greatly appreciate it. And if you can't take care of yourself, it's okay. But I thought I would ask that. And then after we have questions and answers, we are going to wrap up um, and that'll be our agenda for today. So just a little bit about INTAC. Um, INTAC is the National Training and Technical Assistance Center for Child, Youth, and Family Mental Health. And we um, are basically made up of some incredible national partners, partners that have come together to utilize their ex expertise and their subject matter knowledge to help inform the field by creating products, resources, and sessions just like this one to enhance the behavioral and mental health fields. And so on the screen, you can see some of our partners. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I am employed by Change Matrix, but you also see that we have uh, CARS or the Center, of, uh, Center for Applied Research Solutions, we have the Texas Institute for Excellence in Mental Health. 
um, which is at the University of Texas at Austin. We have FRETLA, we have Youth Move National, we have the American Academy of Pediatrics, uh, Georgetown University Hospital, and also the Center for Child and Human Development. Um, as a center, our vision is that all children, youth, and families that are living with or impacted by um, and or impacted by mental health challenges will have access to the resources and opportunities that they need to thrive in a comprehensive and equitable system of care. We serve a wide cross-sector audience, including everyone from state leaders to providers, to school workforce, to infant and early childhood providers, community-based providers, peers, family partners, you name it, we have at our table. And so our services range from individual consultation to more in-depth ses sessions like the one we are offering today. Um, we also have peer learning exchanges and, and tons of resources and tools that are available to you at our website. Our aim is to really create those outlets uh, for communication, collaboration, and resource sharing um, amongst us all because we really, um, it really takes all of us. Um, it takes a cross uh, system approach to really address um, the issue of mental health, much like IPV. So we ask that you would visit our website for more information on how to access our services. Um, the other thing is we want you to look up, look in your email for a follow-up um, after today's uh, webinar. You will be provided with a certificate of completion um, for this event. Uh, there will be a copy of this presentation shared with you if you register for this event. Um, however, I want to note that um, some uh, family photos are shared in Casey's uh, presentation. Those will um, have been uh, omitted. Uh, from the uh, slides that will be shared with you. And that makes sense, right? We don't want to share anyone's uh, family photos. And so, but you will get the content uh, from this session emailed to you. And also we are recording this session. Casey has given us uh, the thumbs up to be able to do that, which I really want to say thank you for allowing um, your story to be recorded. Um, and, and we will share a copy of this recording um, because it is a topic that we think is so critical and needs to be shared abroad. All right. Um, so before we get started and talk more about the impact of IPV on children, I want to quickly just poll you all and see um, when you think about children and intimate partner violence, I want to know one word that comes to mind. What comes to mind for you? And I want you to just um, get that in your head. Don't type it just yet. If you were in our first session, we did this. But I'm going to ask that you would type it, but do not press, uh, do not press enter just yet. We're gonna allow there to be what we call a chatterfall that happens just so we can see what comes to mind. Some folks have already done it, but it's okay if you can just hold off. And I'm gonna ask that you would press enter now. Wow, look at all of that. Fear, trauma, sadness, confused, trauma, 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 fear, consequences, right? Self-blame, low self-esteem, tragic, intergenerational, vulnerable, abandoned, feeling of, of loss, rejection, disconnection. Wow. Low self-esteem, pain. All right. Overcoming. Yes. I love that. Let's balance this out. Intergenerational trauma, neglected. Okay. So we have a lot of thoughts about this. And so we, um, yeah, I, I love the fact that we are able to bring in Casey, um, who is not just a survivor of this, who has lived this, um, but has done some incredible work um, at the national level around this as well to help us to understand what what impact does it have um, and what is our Oh, Gia, you're muted. All of a sudden. Look at that. I'm muted. I'm sorry. There you go. Now you're back. Okay, I'm back here. Um, but yeah, um, I see all of the, I don't know what at what point I was muted, but all of the uh, words coming down, we see a lot of trauma, a lot of fear, a lot of all of that, but I'm just really excited to be able to have Casey here to share a little bit more with us. And hopefully when we leave, we'll have a little bit more um, information. Strength and resilience. Yes, I love that. Thank you. Let's balance it out. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about this beautiful human being um, 
who has uh, graced us today with her presence. Uh, before I do that, I do want to say that we are talking about a topic that can be triggering, right? When we talk about intimate partner violence, um, yeah, uh, it can be triggering. And so we're going to ask you to make sure that you take care of yourself. Take care of yourself. As you're listening to this session and as Casey is sharing her story, um, yeah, we know that there are folks that are on this uh, webinar who have been impacted themselves um, or who know someone has had. So we just want to make sure we prioritize self, prioritize care. Um, we also want to share uh, some resources with you. So we have the National Domestic Violence Hotline information on the screen, and we're also putting it in the chat. So please utilize this resource if you need it. All right. So we want to make sure that we um, also um, have you take care of yourself. Thank you. So a little bit about Casey, enough, enough hearing from me. Uh, let me share a little bit with you about Casey. Casey believes that social change is both possible and necessary. A survivor of childhood trauma and mother to two inspiring children, her passion is nurturing, resilient, and equitable communities where all children can thrive. With more than 20 years of experience in gender-based violence advocacy, Casey knows that our work must be grounded in and guided by the needs and priorities and leadership of those with lived experience at the intersections of violence and oppression. So I am so honored to introduce you all to uh, Casey King. One thing that I want to also say to you all before I give it over to Casey, um, it's just a little quote from one of the resources that I, I would encourage, it's an old resource, but a good one. And it's called Little Eyes, Little Ears. And what it says is a child who lives with violence is forever changed, but not forever damaged. And so I am going to hand uh, over the mic and the, the uh, this platform over to Casey to share her story of strength and resilience. Thank you, Casey. Oh, Gia, that was beautiful. Thank you so much for the lovely introduction and the perfect quote. Thank you all for all that you've shared um, in the chat. It's clear you have a good sense of um, what we're talking about today. Um, and I I'm so appreciate the warm welcome and the opportunity to be in community with you. Um, I do want to start by acknowledging that today is Indigenous Peoples Day. Uh, which is a celebration of the culture and the history and the contributions of Native people. I actually live on the occupied land of the Susquehannock people here in Pennsylvania, not too far from the Carlisle Boarding School, um, which, if you may know, is um, a school was a place where thousands of Native children were taken from their families and their tribes stripped of their language and their culture, abused, and many died um, there. So I would like to honor those children. I would like to hold them in our hearts today. And I would like us together to commit to appreciating and harnessing the power of resilience and resistance in our stories uh, of trauma across generations. So just want to take a moment for that. Um, yes, it's been a long time since I've shared my story. Gia and I were just talking, uh, and Gia and I go back a very long time. Um, and it's been since before the pandemic that I've actually shared this story. Um, I was eight years old, uh, when my mother married a man who brought violence and fear into our lives. Um, I was 12 years old when we fled for our lives, along with my baby brother and my eight-year-old sister. Um, and I was 19 when I wrote my story. So I'm going to be sharing pieces of that with you today. So what you're seeing on the screen now, these are my amazing kids. Uh, Gabe is now 15 and Nathan on the right is 11. And I want to start by this because I just feel so grateful for the peace that they have in our home. Um, and I want to acknowledge that watching them move through the ages that I was when I experienced abuse um, really inspires me not only to nurture them, but also 
to better see and nurture the little girl inside of me. So we can move to the next slide. I also wanna acknowledge that we have survived a global pandemic together. Um, and I'm sure that none of us ever imagined we'd experience anything like this. Um, this is what I would call an experience of collective trauma. I want us to consider together how much has changed because of the pandemic in our personal lives, in the workplace, in the educational system, consumerism, governance, so much, so, so much. Um, and we are still uncovering new impacts of this experience. We are hopefully taking lessons from this experience and intentionally changing the way we do things as a result. Perhaps it inspired you to reevaluate and reorganize your priorities and values. Maybe it prompted you to make some changes uh, in your career or interests. Um, maybe it made you appreciate things you had taken for granted, like in-person gatherings or hugs. But one thing that it definitely did was help all of us understand on a much deeper level what it's like to experience and recover from daily ongoing trauma and what it takes for us to be resilient, both individual and collectively in the face of that trauma. We can move to the next slide. So there's a photo of me when I was about eight years old. Um, not long before um, my mother's uh, abuser entered our lives. And there's my mom. And I'm going to start by telling a bit of a bit of my story. We were all sitting down for a family dinner. As Roger's wife, cooking dinner every night was one of mom's duties. She did this with precision, the same way she did all of her household duties. It didn't, didn't take much for Roger to get angry. I suppose that's an understatement. Let me rephrase by saying that Roger searched for any excuse to be angry. He kept a hawk eye on every move that was made. He let nothing pass and no slip up was small enough for him to overlook. And so we sat at the dinner table. Even my 11 year old eyes could detect the darkness that had begun to surround us. It was a vibe that shook your body still. It was a silence that screamed in your head. Our plates were complete with meat, potatoes, and vegetables. The serving bowl stood evenly spaced in the middle of the table. The meat was sliced and garnished on its pewter serving platter. The peas were fresh from the garden and steaming in their casserole dish. The mashed potatoes sat in a heavy green crockery bowl, a pat of butter melting a neat hole in its center and freshly cut parsley flakes strewn about the top. A basket of warm rolls was lined with a clean cloth. Each glass was filled with cold milk. There were folded cloth napkins at each place setting that were held by pewter rings. Two candles burned at either end of the table. Everything was in order and everything was color coordinated, but something was wrong and we all knew it. We just didn't know yet what mom had done wrong this time. Liz and I ate carefully. We didn't speak unless spoken to. We crossed our legs at the ankles. We kept our elbows off the table. There was a comment about the meal. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Roger said that he was sick of eating shit. We continued to eat. Hmm. Sorry, wrong pipe. And then we started pushing the peas onto our forks with our fingers. And that was the event that broke the blackness in the air. Roger told mom that her girls had disgusting eating habits. We were not to play with our food by helping our peas onto our forks. He couldn't bear to watch it anymore. And mom defended us. She said that we were just kids. She said that we hadn't done anything wrong. And Roger picked up his plate still full with the meals that mom had taken great pains to prepare just right. In one swoop, he threw the plate at the wall. It shattered and the peas went rolling. Will burst into tears. Roger burst into a fit of anger. He began screaming, you're worthless. You can't even get a meal right. And that's all you have to do all day, fucking cunt. 
Mom scrambled to pick up the food and the broken glass. She yelled for me to take the kids upstairs. I stared at her in shock. Now, she yelled as the tears began to, to fill between Roger's obscenities. I took the baby and told Liz to come with me. We went upstairs to the bedroom and turned up the radio. We stared at each other as I tried to calm the baby. It had happened again. It was almost the same story every night. The only difference was the excuse he used to justify his violent rage. But this time, his excuse was us. He used us a lot as time went by. It was the only way he knew that he could get a reaction from mom anymore. She had stopped standing up for herself, but she would never stop standing up for her children. Okay, we can move to the next slide. So what I hope that you took from my story was some of these uh, common themes that emerge for kids who experience domestic violence. And one of them is this environment of fear that we were living in, this fear and tension that happened all the time. For us, it was a fear for our mom. We didn't necessarily fear for our own safety because we did trust that she wouldn't let us get hurt. But we also had feelings of guilt, realizing that he was using us to get to our mom. Um, we realized that no matter what our mom did, there was going to be a violent episode that he would find some reason to become violent. And I do wanna highlight that that year at Christmas, we received um, we received a gift in our stockings. They make these little utensils that look like um, garden hose. It has a long handle and a flat edge. And they are literally a tool that you can use to push food onto your fork when you're eating at the dinner table. So the extent of the self-blame around that incident having been about, you know, if we had only been able to not use our fingers to eat the peas, I think it just illustrates the extent of the kind of guilt and self-blame that happens in families who are experiencing domestic violence. But one thing I do want to point out is the are these unspoken actions in the story the ways that we worked together as a family, the ways that we did, the things that we did to protect ourselves, setting the table perfectly, crossing our, our, our legs at the ankles, being very well behaved, thinking falsely as we know that there was, if we were perfect, maybe there wouldn't be violence. Okay, we can move to the next slide. So there are lessons in this kind of experience um, and some of these lessons can get in the way of forming healthy relationships for kids who do have this experience, but these are lessons that can be unlearned. Um, and so things like we hurt the people we love, that lying and manipulation are ways to get what you want. Yes, we learn these things and we can unlearn these things. Um, we learn that life is like a roller coaster, uh, not knowing that it actually doesn't have to be. So we can move to the next slide. Then there are these common responses for children who experience domestic violence, all of them very logical reactions to experiencing trauma on a daily basis. Um, some of these might look familiar to you as having experienced a global pandemic. During that time, you may have um, felt some numbness, you may have withdrawn, um, you may have had trouble sleeping. Um, all of these things are normal reactions to trauma. And these are some of the things that we see in children who are experiencing it. We can move to the next slide. So I really appreciate this quote from Joan uh, Schladale. She says, trauma is a common human experience that is largely overlooked in existing explanations of and responses to human behavior. So really, it's the acknowledgement that trauma is a common human experience that I find so compelling, and also that it explains so much about how we behave in relationship to each other, what we expect from others, what we need from others, how we treat others. Um, so much of this is determined by our experiences of trauma. We can move to the next slide. So just to give a sense of how common, this is what we mean. Most American children are exposed to violence in their daily lives, over half in the past year, and then even more over our lifetimes. 
take a drink. <clears throat> um, this is something that is um, probably more common than we want to acknowledge. We'll move to the next slide. But the good news is that resilience is also really common. Most children exposed to trauma are resilient. We are typically impressed when we see resilience after trauma, but this is something that tells us it's not magic. It's actually quite ordinary. Our brains are actually wired to endure hardship throughout our lives, and there are many mechanisms in place um, that help protect us and see us through. So you see the quote here from Ann Mastin, the great surprise of resilience research is the ordinariness of the phenomena. So we can move to the next slide. So the ACE-DV project is a project of the National Resource Center on Domestic Violence that I co-founded back in 2014. And it's comprised of adult children exposed to domestic violence who are also advocates leading this work. Um, part of the work that the ACE-DV project does draws on lessons from the collective stories of children who experience domestic violence. Together, we've identified some common themes that I'll be sharing with you um, today. And the first is that we want people to understand both of these things to be true at the same time. Trauma is common, and most ACEDV or adult children who has experienced domestic violence heal and thrive. Both of those things can be true at the same time. Okay, we can move to the next slide. So. I'm going to tell you a story about my sister, Liz. My sister and I shared a room from the day she was born in April of 1983. I was jealous of her then, as I am today. She's beautiful. She has wide, sparkling, crystal blue seas behind the soft lids of her eyes. They are framed by a forest of dark, beautifully thick lashes. Her teeth are a little too big for her mouth which makes her smiles twice as vibrant. It also makes her look silly when she tries to close her mouth, but what a wonderful flaw to have when a smile is most comfortable. I watched as the innocence slowly faded from her face. It was a reflection of my own face as the years went by. Sometimes we would sit near the door with our ears pressed to it. We were listening for a reason to dramatically enter the argument like a superhero to defend our mother and defeat the enemy with a witty one-liner. But we were too weak for this, and listening at the door only made us feel smaller. Sometimes we would just lay in bed and stare at the wall. We wanted to sleep. We wanted to be able to turn off the sound so that it would go away. We tried to ignore it, and we tried to figure out what to do, not knowing there was nothing we could do. The fighting always sounded the same. There was Roger's voice yelling horrible names and accusations at mom. There was mom's voice with a soft howling cry. She would often repeat something over and over as she sobbed. I'm sorry, please stop. I'm sorry, please stop. Or no, please, no, please. And there were the sounds of thumps, crashes and the slapping of skin. Often there was silence immediately following these. Roger would call Liz or me into the room to ask us a question about the fight. Most of the time it was me. That is when I saw the image that corresponded with the sounds I heard at bedtime. Roger would be standing. Mom would be sitting on the ground. She would sit with her legs pulled close to her body and her arms around her knees. In her protective ball, she would rock and moan with the cries that had taken over her body. Her hair was stringy and wet from tears and sweat. Her face was bruised and covered by the oceans that escaped her eyes. Sometimes her lips were bloody. Sometimes her eyes were black. Always, makeup ran down her face, making her look as hollow as I knew she was. It was so hard when Roger called me in. He would ask me a question about something mom said. He would say something like, did your mother say that or not? And I found myself drowning. If I agreed with Roger's side, he would beat her more for being wrong. If I agreed with mom's side, 
he would beat her more because I was a liar. I lost either way, and I would leave the room with the pain of defeat. Mom knew that this way of living wasn't right. She told Liz and I to tape record the fights so that she would have proof when the day came that she would take him to court. We made a tape. The next week, she made us destroy it because she was afraid that he would find it. And so the fighting went on. I watched my sister and she watched me. Let's go to the next slide. So what can helpers do? What do we learn from this kind of a scenario that can help us in providing the support that families need? So there's complex dynamics that happen in families, right? especially between children and their siblings and their caregivers, both the abusive and non-abusive caregiver. Um, you heard, you know, in my story, the way that I felt trapped, manipulated, my loyalties challenged. Um, we need to appreciate that, that things are not always black and white. We need to reflect back feelings of powerlessness that children feel, the helplessness of listening to the fighting and knowing that there was nothing we could do about it. We need to reflect back that there's nothing they could have done and there's nothing they should have done. We need to help families realize their collective strength. Like how wonderful was it that my sister and I had each other? How wonderful that we could support each other in that moment. And we really need to help build children's trust in their, in their protective parent. Um, yeah, that they would, uh, that they were there for them, helping them navigate these difficult things. So let's move on to my brother, Will. This is an entry from my diary, November 4th, 1990. I love Roger so much, but he doesn't love me. Mom loves me more than life itself. I love everybody in my family. You don't know how much it hurts to love somebody so much and that person not love you. I needed to tell somebody this and have them listen and understand. I knew yesterday while looking through Roger's wallet that he didn't like me or Liz. He put our pictures both in the back of his wallet. Guess who's in the front? William. Roger loves William, but he doesn't love me. Another reason I know is because he told us, Liz and I, to stay away from him and Will when we were home. I love mom, Liz, Roger, and William. How could he? He just loves himself and William. Love, Casey. When Roger was home, we had to leave him alone with Will. Most of the time, Roger would take the baby into the basement to do woodworking. There was a high chair down there with a chain on it. Roger would sit Will in the chair and chain him in so that he couldn't fall out, let alone move. From upstairs, we could hear Roger's woodworking tools and Will's crying. This is what Roger referred to as father-son time. The baby was 11 months old and wasn't getting much bigger. Will was sick. He was in and out of the hospital. The doctors couldn't figure it out, but babies who don't move can't grow. So let's move to the next slide. There's some, I think, really interesting things uh, about this particular story. Gia, we can, yep. Um, one of them is sort of the cues that children pick up on, right? They know what's going on. They know much more about the dynamics than you might think. And so to me, the favoritism was very clear. Um, and also, you know, the self, the selfishness of the behavior that he was engaged in, um, I also want to note that in those scenarios, when he would bring him down to do woodworking, that my mother would um, stand at the top of the basement stairs with the door cracked, waiting for just the right time to rescue my brother. It never lasted quite, you know, that too long. I mean, any any moment is long enough, right? But she always found a, a reason to go down. She would wait until the baby was squirming and whining and you know, sort of be like, let me take him off your hands kind of a thing. But also I think it illustrates the inappropriateness of that kind of activity to engage in with an infant. And for an adult to think that it's age appropriate 
to do woodworking with an infant, we all know is totally inappropriate. And that's a characteristic we know of those uh, who abuse uh, perpetrators of domestic violence. They often have a limited understanding of age appropriateness of activities for children and just child development in general. So some of the things to take away, oh, I guess the other thing I should note is that when Will was born, he was six pounds, eight ounces. And at six months old, he was six pounds, 14. He really wasn't gaining weight. And the doctors were very concerned. They told my mom that it was failure to thrive, but they said that they didn't know what caused it. They said it just happens with some babies and just feed him some uh, cereal and bananas and he'll get over it. Later, we learned that failure to thrive, it, one of the things that's linked to is uh, trauma, violence in uh, in childhood. And so if we had known then at the moment, I my mom has said, we would have left immediately. She did not realize the impact that the trauma we were experiencing at home was having on him, especially, and his failure to thrive. So these are signs that we can look for. These are very obvious signs um, of abuse and neglect. Um, and so that's one of the very first things we can do as helpers. Um, we also can allow children to tell their story in their own way. I know in my diary entry, I said something really interesting. I said, I just need somebody to listen and understand. I think we need to pay attention to those kinds of words because that's, I was saying exactly what I needed. Children do know what they need and they will tell their story in their own way. I also think we need to give non-abusive parents the right tools and information as I said, if my mom had known, she may have made different choices. And so um, it's a really important thing that we can do as helpers. So let's move to the next slide. So we know that every survivor experiences trauma differently, resulting in different impacts and outcomes uh, for each individual. This rings true even in the same family system uh, by two siblings who share a bedroom as is the case for me and my sister. The assets and the consequences can look different among siblings, each with their own perspective and their own distinct memories of events. My sister and I have compared notes and I remember things she doesn't remember. She remembers things I don't remember. We, all, we each had a sep separate takeaways. However, we all know that the power of relationships is a key factor in promoting resilience. We are all the same in the ways that we draw power and strength from those kinds of bonds. So let's move to the next slide. So here is an example, um, sort of comparing me and my siblings and our experiences. And I wanna highlight um, some of the mitigating factors, some of the things that changed the outcomes for each of us because of these key differences. So first was the fact that I was school age, my sister was play age, and my brother was an infant. So the experiences will be different based on our age. They also are different based on our developmental stage. And so Eric Erickson has these um, eight stages of psychosocial development. And uh, I've noted here what stage each of us was in. So I was in this stage called industry versus inferiority, um, which means that if you don't succeed um, at that particular uh, developmental challenge, you may come out questioning your self-worth, um, seeking validation, maybe having imposter syndrome, which I may or may not comment on later. Um, also, my sister was um, at the... Uh, play age. And so her challenge was initiative versus guilt. And somebody who isn't successful at accomplishing that task might start doubt their own abilities. Um, they may work furiously to prove their value through work. Um, then my brother, trust versus mistrust. This is about attachment. I think many of us in this room know all about attachment. Um, and what secure versus insecure attachment looks like. And for my brother, it certainly showed up as insecure attachment. 
which meant that uh, he had mistrust, suspicion, anxiety um, in his relationships. And so you'll see the, the position that we are in the family, oldest, middle, or youngest, that's a mitigating factor that makes a difference. Whether we were male or female made a particular difference in our relationship with uh, my mother's abuser because he um, clearly favored boys and men and rejected um, women and girls um, as like uh, limited to certain roles in society. Um, and then whether we were his stepchildren or his biological child, what made a difference, uh, Will was his biological child. He was favored for that reason. Um, you may have noticed in my first story that he referred to us as my mother's girls. So your girl, your girls, um, was always the way that he would talk about us. He didn't claim any ownership of us because we weren't technically biologically his. Um, we can move to the next slide. So this is a note about sort of the areas of impairment that we tend to see um, for people who experience trauma. Um, and I think that you know these things well. I'm not going to linger here because I like to talk more about assets. So we'll go to the next slide. You can kind of see these, these uh, different domains. And I'm going to talk about how each of us uh, sort of presented, which domains sort of uh, presented for each of us. Um, so let's move to the next slide, Gia. Thank you. So, okay, <laughs> this is a similar chart showing sort of how, what the outcomes were for us in later life. So how did it play out for us in adulthood? So I am known in my family as the camp director. Um, basically, it's because of my need to uh, not not just have control, but to anticipate what's going to happen, to know what's going to happen. So I tend to be a planner because if I can plan a thing that I'm more um, likely to know what to expect and how it's going to work out, which means that when there's a change, it really provokes anxiety in me, no matter how big or small, as simple as, oh, it's going to rain, let's move it to a different day can cause uh, feelings of anxiety in me. So you'll see that my primary domain of impairment is around control. And that's really common. Um, that can play out in uh, many different forms. Um, it can play out as eating disorders, um, self-harm, like different ways that strategies that uh, coping strategies that people use to gain control. Um, my sister, I think uh, for her, her primary feeling um, is anger about the situation and anger tends to be her presenting emotion. Most of the time she has very extreme emotional reactions and difficulty, um, identifying and verbalizing her feelings outside of anger, um, which I know is something that she's working very hard on. So affect regulation then is the primary domain that it was impacted for my sister. And then my brother, uh, um, operates from a place of fear, um, lives, you know, with anxiety, panic attacks, mental health challenges. Um, so attachment and biology was the primary domain of impairment for him. Okay, let's move to the next one. So another theme from our stories, as people, we often experience various types of trauma throughout our lives. And the very coping strategies that we use, coexisting conditions we may experience, and systemic oppression we experience can compound that trauma. But these experiences are part of who we are. They promote growth and they help us develop specialized skills for adaptation. So let's move on. So very quickly, I just want to touch on the fact, uh, this is research from Dr. Sherry Hamby. The term is called polyvictimization, and it's the idea, it's the fact that children who experience one type of violence are more likely to experience other types of violence. So the kids who experience bullying, child abuse, school violence, gang violence, teen dating violence, we're, we're not talking about different kids here. We're often talking about the same kid, which is why our siloed approaches to these, uh, to these issues can be ineffective um, because we're all trying to reach that same kid. And go to the next slide. So no surprises here. Um, this chart shows how the more lifetime victimizations, the greater the trauma symptoms may be. Next slide. 
So you may be familiar with this, likely very familiar with the ACEs study conducted by Kaiser Permanente and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. They found that adverse childhood experiences are common, that they often occur together, and that they impact the health, social, and behavioral problems across the lifespan. Of course they do, right? That makes perfect sense. So um, any, but any one of us can take the ACE study questionnaire to find out our ACE score. Probably many of you in this room know what your ACE score is. I'm not going to ask you to share it. Um, but the idea is that the higher your ACE score, the greater risk of experiencing uh, mental and physical health challenges. It's important to understand the intersecting trauma that we can experience in, in childhood because these are factors that really do shape our lives going forward. Next slide. But how can we learn to look at an ACE score and see beyond the negative consequences or a determined path of doom and gloom? What if we looked at an ACE score and instead asked, how did it make you stronger? And that is called post-traumatic growth. So let's go to the next slide. I would like you to take just a moment and consider your ACE assets. So if you could just sit quietly with yourself and think about your experiences of childhood adversity. Think about a time when you suffered, maybe a time when you weren't sure how you would make it through, a time when you felt afraid or desperate or disillusioned or broken. And I want you to sit and think about what you learned about yourself through that experience. What surprised you about how you moved through that time? What tools did you draw on? What strengths did you uncover? I want you to think about how that experience changed you, how it informed your path going forward. How does it impact the decisions that you make? Maybe it expanded your worldview or your understanding of others? How did it change your relationships or your goals or your beliefs or your values? It might be the thing that fuels you in doing this work. And so I want you to sit with that as we talk through the next couple slides. So you can advance the slide. There are some positive impacts of trauma that the research has identified. Things like a renewed appreciation for life or a commitment to live life to the fullest and value each day. Some of these things might ring true for you coming out of this global pandemic. Um, it can change you spiritually. It can change the things that you value, that you rely on. So let's move to the next slide. I want to highlight for you responses from adult children exposed to domestic violence that they identified when they were asked that same question, what have you gained? So they gained things like an enhanced awareness of red flags, what they, what they even are, you know, uh, once you know them, you see them everywhere. Um, advanced protective capacity, right? I'm proud of my ability to protect and take care of people because of my experience taking care of my mom. High tolerance for stress, creative high-level problem-solving skills. That's something we hear a lot about like, hey, I problems don't intimidate me. I know my way around a problem. I've had much bigger challenges in my life. Um, greater flexibility or acceptance in relationships, positive parenting choices. I guarantee you the choices that I make in my parenting are absolutely informed by this experience and wanting my children to have a different experience than I did. And then increased empathy, sort of treating others with kindness, knowing that you that they may be going through something. So let's talk about the shelter. Um, and I'm doing just a little time check here. Okay, I think we're all right. We pulled up to the abused women's shelter in Lancaster. I had pictured rows of bunk beds in a long cold room, but that's not what it was like at all. It was a large house with lots of bedrooms. There were women talking and laughing. There were babies playing. I could smell breakfast cooking. The counselor seemed very nice. I held my brother and kept my sister close as mom talked with the woman in the office. 
Then we made it up to our bedroom. We stayed at the shelter for three weeks. Mom went to a lot of counseling sessions. Liz did too, and I took care of Will. Once in a while, mom forced me to go to the kids' groups. I hated it. I didn't want to talk to the counselors, so I never did. Oftentimes, they would come up to me and ask me how I was. Fine, I would reply, the same way I had always done when a concerned teacher asked me how things were at home. And then I would go about my business. After a few days, one of the counselors told me that there was a teen room. Although there were many children staying at the shelter, there were no teens, but she explained that I was close enough and she showed me the room. It was awesome. There was a huge television and VCR. There was a record player with lots of records. There was a plush couch where I found a spot that I could truly be comfortable. I went down there as much as I could. That is where I could be alone. I found a record by Stevie Wonder and I learned the words to every song. Every day my homework from school was brought to me and I would work on it diligently. That marking period I maintained all A's. I wanted my mom to know that I would not, I wouldn't cause her any problems. By the second week, mom had lots of court dates and meetings and interviews. She obtained a protection from abuse order. She worked on getting herself back on her feet. She spent her time regaining her strength and remembering who she was. And I helped her by taking care of the kids so she could do just that. So let's go to the next slide. I realize that some of you may have had some red flags come up with that story around a term we call parentification. And I just want to note that, yes, I do think that there can be some harmful things about um, assigning adult roles to children. But I want to take a moment to reflect on the healing in me being able to play that kind of a role, in me being able to help our family through this difficult time and be helpful to my family, take care of my little brother. It made me feel like I had a role and like I had a voice and it made me part of our healing process. And so I want to note that because I think as you've probably heard me talk about, these, these things aren't black and white. I also want to note that we need to advocate for consistency in our children's lives. My mom actually advocated with the school. There was um, a teacher whose spouse worked in the city pretty close to the shelter. And so she made an arrangement so that I could have the homework delivered. She could have the homework delivered to me every day so that I wouldn't fall behind because she knew how important school was for me. Um, and we need to help identify safe and consistent support people um, in kids' lives, right? And so to me, what I needed the most was respite. The teen room gave me respite and peace and solitude. And so the fact that they had that there for me made a huge difference. So let's move to the next slide. This is a picture of the farmhouse that we moved into um, when we left the shelter. Um, it was a wreck. Um, and my mom made it beautiful for us. The rent was incredibly affordable. It was like a literal farmhouse out in the middle of nowhere, but it was in our school district. And I think the rent was like $450 a month. And so she moved us there, me, um, and my brother and my sister. Yes. I actually have seen the house pretty recently. It's not in great shape. <laughs> Thanks for noting that in the chat, um, but it was beautiful. And she worked on that house every day. Um, she would go out, she would work during the day. And then at night she would go and she would uh, paint and stencil the floors and the walls and um, yeah. And when we moved into it, um, we were so happy. I remember doing cartwheels in the, in the lawn. Let's go to the next slide. So just a couple notes about resilience. Um, it is an innate human capacity that can be developed in anyone. It's about identifying and building our internal resources. And um, promoting resilience is truly our work. So I love this quote. It isn't about pushing through and past your limits. It's about building capacity and resource internally so that you have the energy to skillfully meet what life is presenting you. So next slide. 
as the same way that we have the uh, the ACEs tools so that people can find out their ACE score, we have many tools for measuring resilience. And so I would suggest that we never find out a person's ACE score without also finding out what their resilience or hope score might be. And so some of these tools are available, they're free, they're out there, and we can use them in our work to help people identify those things that can help build their capacity for resilience. So let's move to the next slide. These, what, what children exposed to domestic violence need is the same thing that all children need. They need respite and freedom and family support and hope and optimism and models of nurturing, respect and compassion. We all need the same things. There's no special formula. Next slide, what my brother needed. So this is a t-shirt that my brother made um, in a domestic violence summer camp program. It says, if my dad didn't hit, we could fish. That was him at age seven saying what he needed. We can go to the next page. Um, Changing Minds um, is a great resource if you're not familiar with it. Um, from and I'm going to put the link in the chat from um, Futures Without Violence, and it offers five everyday gestures that we can use in relationship and communication with children to help foster their strength and resilience. Move to the next slide. I'm just cognizant of time and wanting to get to uh, through so we can get to your questions. Um, the path to resilience. So one of the things we know about resilience and I see someone in the chat noting Michael Unger's research. Yes, um, how children who feel that they're making a meaningful contribution, yes, to the family can do well. And that's, I think why it's so important. Um, that's the science of mattering, right? So the science of mattering says that it's a reciprocal relationship that I feel like I matter because I of what I gain from others, um, knowing that there's others who are supportive to me in my life, and also what I give to others. And so sometimes we underestimate that what we give um, and the value of what we give in promoting our own sense of mattering um, and value. And so I think that that's really important to look at. But building by building our own capacity for resilience, we actually can help foster those adaptive skills in the children we encounter, in the families that we work with. There's really power in modeling this process. And that's why all of us need to be working on building our own resilience and modeling that for others. I do want to note that resilience is really a process. There's no beginning, there's no end, there's no certificate. I certainly don't have one, but our lives are ever evolving narratives, right? And so we may experience trauma at different points and therefore the path to healing and resilience is really this ongoing thing. And so, um, and our capacity ebbs and flows and that's okay. And that's as it should be. So I love this quote, the healing process isn't about becoming who you might have been had you not experienced trauma. It's about integrating the wisdom you've gained from the experience into your life. It's about incorporating that wisdom. And that, that comes from a, an article in Psychology Today. Um, and so on this slide, you'll see some of the different things that you can practice to build your own resilience um, on a daily basis. Okay, next slide. So just to bring it home around hope, um, ACEs can last a lifetime, but they don't have to. We can reboot our brains. We have the capacity within ourselves to create better health. So in the next couple of slides, I'm going to show you sort of where we are now. So this next slide is a picture of uh, my sister on the left, my mom, and then me and my brother. This was at my mom's retirement party. So my mom retired after uh, 30 years of doing domestic violence advocacy work. Um, she, no, not 30 years, 20 years. She, uh, thank you. They are, they're beautiful, aren't they? Um, my mom directed a dual domestic and sexual violence program. 
Um, she started a transitional housing program there. Um, she did some amazing work um, in her time there. And so celebrating her retirement from that work um, and wishing her ease and peace uh, in making that transition, um, you know, is, yeah, it's really what I want for her. Um, so this is my sister, Liz, um, taken during the time in her life when she, uh, lived out in Colorado and was a wild, a, a white water rafting instructor out there. My sister is incredibly adventurous. Um, I will say that she is in a long-term committed relationship with a loving partner. Um, they have been together, I think almost 20 years now. Um, she's also a, um, anti-war and left-wing political act activist. And after working in as, as a staff attorney at the Pennsylvania coalition against domestic violence, she is now the executive director of the Pennsylvania utility law project. And so the work that she does there is advocating for low income Pennsylvanians rights to basic utilities. She does amazing work. I'm so impressed and so proud of her. And the best news is that she actually lives next door to me. So since I had my, my first son, she has been my next door neighbor and uh, we've been doing it together. So love having Aunt Liz next door. Let me go to the next slide. So this is Will. Um, he was brilliant. He graduated early from high school. He studied philosophy, linguistics, and computer programming at the University of Pennsylvania, where he also worked in the science lab. He was sensitive and thoughtful and warm and the best uncle. He was an exceptionally bright kid, perhaps too bright for his own good. Um, he struggled with panic attacks and anxiety, and he ended up developing schizophrenia in young adulthood. So I have come to learn that the abuse that he suffered in utero as early as that may have been the thing that switch, flipped the switch to trigger that uh, adolescent onset schizophrenia. It has been 11 years now since my brother took his life. He was 22. He left lessons for all of us. And so I'm gonna share some of those lessons with you today. Let's go to the next slide. So I found this card uh, that I kept from my brother and I was amazed by the wisdom inside. And so um, I wanna share this with you, a direct quote from him. Lately, I have found peace through love. I've learned to love my father, though I do not know him, and though I often observe the reverberating consequences of his abusive nature. There is no evil, just distance from good, and the one path to peace is through unconditional, humble, and unselfish love. So let's move to the next slide. There are ripples that can continue to come from these experiences of childhood trauma our whole life long. So one of the lessons that I learned from my brother, Will, yes, beautiful, beautiful soul, is that what happens to you in the early stages of your life can have lifelong impacts that we really need to pay attention to. It is not enough to serve children while they are experiencing trauma or immediately following the trauma, we have to figure out a way to continue to be available and of service to kids throughout their lives as they sort of deal with these reverberations and ripples. One of the other important lessons that I learned from my brother is that the way we talk about those who cause harm really, really matters. I know that um, for my brother's life, throughout my brother's life, we talked about my mother's abuser in very one-dimensional ways. We talked about him as though he was a monster. And when we do that, it can have the impact of those kids, especially those who share their genetic makeup, 
really wondering if they're monsters too. And so I saw my brother struggle with that, with trying to figure out who he was, trying to figure out if he was part monster. And so that's why when he talks about learning to love his father and accept his father, I really think that's something that he needed from us was to be able to talk about his father as a human, as a person who experienced trauma himself, as a person who, as my brother said, wasn't evil. Uh, my brother describes there is no evil, just distance from good. I think that's a really important lesson for all of us in the way that we communicate with children about those who cause us harm. And the most fun lesson from my brother is that we need to appreciate the beauty in the ordinary, which in Japanese is called Wabi Sabi. And this is a children's book that I have been reading with my kids for as long as they would allow it. They're now aging out of me reading to them. But um, Wabi Sabi is about this cat, this beautiful, ordinary cat. He's just a plain looking old, you know, domestic house cat who does not find himself truly remarkable or beautiful. And on Wabi Sabi's journey, he learns to appreciate that. So I planted a tree for my brother. This was a very important thing to my brother, appreciating the beauty and the ordinary. I planted a tree in front of my house. It's beautiful. It's a black gum tree and it's getting very big and it's very healthy. Um, and we put a plaque, uh, commemorating this quote, reminding us to appreciate the beauty in the ordinary. And then this is my last slide. And then I promise I'll stop talking and for a bit anyway, unless you want me to talk more. So this is my sweet family now. Um, this was us on our uh, summer vacation. And so um, you can see the fun and the silliness. And um, I'm just so in love with my sweet kids and my husband. I'll keep him. Um but they just are daily reminders of, uh, you know, just what matters the most. So um, thank you for all of the hearts and the love that you're sharing in the chat. Um, this is very hard for me to talk about, and I feel very held by all of you. So I, I just want to acknowledge how grateful I am uh, for making it, making it safe to talk about these things with you. All right, Gia, I'm going to take a breath. Ah. <sighs> I know, such an amazing story. Thank you so, so much, Casey. Look at the chat just blowing up with so much love and, and admiration um, and condolences and everything. Um, I heard this story over a decade for the first time and it still impacts me um, the same way today. So Casey, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for gifting us with you and your um, your family story. And so I wanted to, I'm going to lower, stop sharing. And I wanted just to open up a little uh, space for any questions. Uh, we might not be able to get to everyone, um, but if there's anything that you wanted to ask Casey relevant to um, what she shared, um, we will give you time to do that. We have about a little bit more than 15 minutes. And so, um, and if you have a question, put a cue. So I know it's a question in the chat. And if you want to come off um, uh, chat and, and say you and verbalize your question, you're able to do that as well. You can just raise your hand. So we'll take a couple of questions if anybody or comments or just whatever you might want to share. All right, I see Elise. I hope I'm saying that right. You can go ahead, Elise. Thank you. Elsie. Yeah. Um... Thank you. Oh, you're good. It's a strange <laughs> spelling. Um, yeah, thank you for for sharing this incredible story with us. And um, I am wondering, as a as a clinician, um, if you have any thoughts on ways to make kids feel comfortable during their first couple meetings with a therapist when they've experienced some of these things um, because of some of the the trust issues and just ways to make them feel safe and comfortable. 
Hmm. That's a good question. I I feel like there's going to be so much wisdom in this room around that question too. So I invite others to, you know, share your thoughts in the chat. I think for me, it really comes back to those, uh, those five sort of everyday gestures um, that changing minds offers us. So they have some really practical, um, ways to engage with kids that I think does bring that comfort, um, that we're looking for so that we can sort of open the space, uh, for trust and sharing. And so, um, I think a lot of it is in the way we react and respond to kids, right. Um, how we are behaving, um, I think um, honoring kids like opinions, like asking them questions about the things that they like. And, you know, I don't know. I, I, I don't feel like I have a great deal of wisdom to offer here, but what I can tell you was really helpful to me was just the permission not to talk was almost as valuable as the invitation to talk. So I think that, you know, just offering the space for kids to take the time they need to, you know, bring those things forward and following their direction, like following, you know, whatever direction they want to move in. It took me many, many years to seek therapy on my own. I didn't do that until I was, you know, in my twenties. So there's a huge gap of time when I wasn't you know, really open to talking about these things. So I don't know. I know permission to not talk may not be the most helpful thing, may not, uh, you know, get you to achieve those therapeutic goals. Um, But sometimes just being present together can be really impactful. I love that. That's, that's really helpful. Thank you. Oh, good. And I see others are offering some advice here too. Mm Mm-hmm. Thank you for that, Casey. And I was going to just second that. I think just space not to talk um, until they're ready is really, really helpful um, from my experience. I want to acknowledge Parrish, who has a question. Thank you so much, Gia. Hi, Casey. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, I resonate with it a whole lot. Um, But I did have a a question when you were talking about how children, um, make sure I say it correctly, how children show, I guess, their response to trauma. And you mentioned a um, increased, I guess, ability to withstand uh, difficulty or something like that. Um, could that be a facade as well? How do you know was a resilience to trauma? Mm-hmm. Could that also be a facade initially? Yeah. Do you want to say more about that? I I just wanted to I just wanted to make sure that when I identify and connect, even with my own children, yeah. um, let alone the little girl within myself, that because I too I guess am 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 the camp director of my family, but I know that a lot of the trauma that I had experienced, that's how it comes out. But I don't know if that resilience is really me. So I wanted to find out, and I wanted to see especially from one of um for my children and other children of course could that resilience be first a facade mm. you know versus it being their true nature if that yeah. makes sense sorry I wrote it but, down but I can't find it anymore yes Parrish it absolutely makes sense and I'm actually looking back through my slides now and I think what you're referring to is one of those ACE DV assets that I identified which was high tolerance for stress exactly yes yeah. Yeah. And I think that, yes. I, so this is the thing. I'm sort of reminded of the, uh, the pressure that uh, the expectation of resilience can bring, right? So this expectation that we be strong, that we be resilient, that, and especially with for Black women, in sort of the way that Black women are expected to be strong culturally, right? Amen. Um, and- <laughs> And so what you're saying sort of reminds me of that and that, yes, we can be strong, but we also need to have permission to fall apart sometimes. We also need to have permission to be held, to feel, to need nurturance, um, to to take a break, right? I think it's unrealistic and um, 
supernatural, like not, not a human ability to be strong and resilient and, and have a high tolerance for stress all the time and be able to navigate hard things all the time. Uh, nobody can do that all the time. So yes, I think we need to give ourselves, um, even though, because I think what you're describing is how it can feel. It can feel like sometimes you're pretending because you don't always have it. And so I just want to offer that that uh, I think offering ourselves some grace around that. Yes, we're strong, but we're also soft. Um, yes, we're resilient, but we also need uh, others to support us. Um, so yeah, I think that's how I would, res- would respond to that. And Gia, I'm sure you have some additional wisdom to share there too. I Thank do not. So I think, yeah, I don't. I think you answered that well, um, but I did want to go to the chat. Um, we have a probably room for a couple more. Um, But Catherine had a question in the chat for you, um, Casey, and she asked, what mechanism did you use to cope during your childhood that helped you? So there's anything specific that I know you talked about, Mm. you know, having those spaces and having a sense of meaning, right, in the family um, and and a sense of, you know, having a role. But is there anything else that you didn't uh, maybe identify that was helpful to you? Journaling sounds like was helpful. (laughs) <laughs> Journaling was huge. I actually, I was like nine years old when my grandmother gave me my first journal and I was actually journaling all through the time when we experienced abuse, which is what I drew on in order to be able to sort of tell the story. Um, and so that was a really helpful thing for me and a helpful part of my healing process was journaling. Um, and then also I would say roller skating. I mm-hmm. love roller skating. Um, and I have to say that when I do have the opportunity to, to go to the rink and, uh, and skate, um, I have this sense of like freedom that I think it sort of just takes me back to being that 12, 13, 14 year old girl and strapping on my skates and just going outside and feeling the, the wind blow through my hair. Like, I think those things that we do as kids are so important to our to our well being. Um, and so, when was the last time you went outside and played in the fall leaves, or you know, I don't know, I don't know what you yeah. did as a kid. Rode a bike, you know, um, but doing those things I think can be powerful, powerful to our to our process. Blowing bubbles, yeah. Thank you. And I think it speaks to the power of play, right? Like even kids that have gone through traumatic experiences need play. And sometimes we can focus so much on therapy and all these other things that are great, but sometimes they just need to have fun. Sometimes they just need to go outside and hit a ball, right? And so we can't um, forget about that. Um, Maybe two more questions. The next question is from Lisa. And she says, um, can you please elaborate more on best practices to talk when talking with kids about their abusive parent? You talked about not, you know, uh, making them a monster. She just said, do you have any like practical examples of what language might be helpful in that? Yeah, I think it's really important that we don't decide how to refer to them, but that we ask the kid how they like to refer to them. Right. So, um, you know, what do you call this person? And then referring to them the way the kid likes to refer to them, I think is important. And then I think it's really important to talk about not uh, that we are not the choices that we make, right? Separate the, the choices we make and the behaviors we engage in from the people that we are. And I think all of us need and deserve that, right? I think if I was sort of defined by all of my choices, I don't know that I would love that um, because I've made good choices and bad choices. And so I think it's really important when we talk to kids to talk about the people as separate from the choices that they made and as separate from the things that happened to them. Um, and that's just person first language, right? So we say things like, um, you know, the person who, who hurt you, um, yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. The parent has made bad choices, but it doesn't make them a bad person. Yep. I think that's the distinction of, you know, with the language there. And I think too, just the acknowledgement, I'll add that these kids, most of them love their parent. And I think it was powerful in your journal entry. You loved Roger. You know, even though you didn't feel he loved you, 
you yes. loved him. And I think we have to acknowledge that. So even in the way that we approach our conversations and understanding that they love and typically want to be with, you know, and still want that person in some ways to be in their life or at least to change the behavior, right? But they still want their presence, just not the behavior. Um, and so that's important to understand as well. And when they do leave, when their, you know, their mother or whoever the survivor is, leaves, that's loss. You know, there's still a grieving process of leaving um, family and leaving someone that they hope maybe would change. And so those are things that we, we need to keep in mind as well, that that love is there. Um, last question. Go ahead. Was there any, were you going to say something else? Oh, just that I'm in total agreement with what you're saying, Gia. Thank you, Casey. And then the last question we're going to take is from Adam. And Adam says that they are a person and a survivor with a disability and their job allows them to advocate for those with disabilities, which also brings with it, a, you know, different variables. What are some practices you use or suggest when approaching these perspectives? Hmm. Yeah, I, but thank you so much for your important work. Um, yeah, I, I mean, and I acknowledge when I tell my story, really, this is just my story with my experience and that there are so many layers of identity and experience that could change the way that I, you know, that, that kids experience trauma. Um, I think, you know, hmm. I think it's a matter of really just uh, getting to understand where kids are and what they need, right? And so there can be many layers of ability or disability that children carry, um, both visible and invisible. And so I think it's a matter of um, listening and being responsive to what those particular needs are, um, whether it's, you know, there are many children who um, experience neurodiversity and may need to receive information in um, alternate ways. We may need to be creative with the way that we uh, communicate with kids because of those things. Um, I don't know that I am an expert on, on uh, meeting the needs of uh, uh, abuse survivors with disabilities, um, but uh, certainly there's many resources I could offer in following up. So Gia, I don't know if anything comes to mind for you. It does, and I think I probably feel the same um, uh, as what you've already stated, um, but maybe some follow-up resources would be helpful. So maybe there's a way, Casey, if you can give your information and maybe there's some follow-up there. Yes. Um, so I want to say thank you again to Casey. I want to thank you all for spending time with us, coming into community with us to listen and engage and honor uh, the strength and resilience. Um, that really is not just in Casey, but in many of you, many of you are disclosing in the chat that you too survived and were, you know, um, childhood, you know, uh, experiences of violence. So, um, and I just want to just say thank you again. Um, before we leave, I want to let you know that we have three more sessions in this series. Um, if you miss, I saw some, uh, in, some comments in the chat, um, but last week's was recorded. And so um, that information was sent out. Um, but the next session will be next Monday, and that will focus on dating violence and young people. And we'll also have an amazing presenter and survivor who will come um, and share um, information as well as their story. That session will not be recorded. So you don't want to miss it. You don't want to miss it. You want to come and experience it live. Um, and then the fourth session will focus on supporting systems to support survivors of intimate partner violence. So really having a panel discussion on the ways that systems help and harm survivors and what does a, a systemic response to intimate partner violence look like. And then our last session um, will be on October 30th and that will be best practices for mental health clinicians. So LC or I think I got that name right. You want to come back because for those of you who work with families, you don't want to miss that. If you are a clinician or a counselor or a co whatever, you want to come back and hear from our amazing panel, panel, uh, panel of clinicians who have expertise in this area as they share some do's and don'ts as it relates to working with those impacted. So again, thank you for your time. Thank you, Casey. Um, I want you all to have an amazing rest of your day. Don't forget to take care of yourself. And I hope to see you all 
in community next week. Um, again, happy Indigenous Day folk, uh, people to everyone, People's Day to everyone, as we acknowledge that. Thank you, Casey, for bringing that into this space. Um, and you all just have an amazing rest of your week. And um, we'll see you next week. Thank you. Take care.